Ching ring cling ang sao, ing ring shing, ka e i la ring, asa ka hala ring, sa ka la ring, sao ang cling ring shing. Aum. Namaste. So. The last few days, I haven't posted anything because I've really been trying to wrap my head around the enormity of the insight that I've been presenting in the last few videos, like this one <laughs> and this one. And uh, basically what it is, is first of all the understanding that if the conditioned states of consciousness, that is Jagrat, Swapna, and Sushupti, are filters, that means they are the mechanism of the upadis. Remember we talked about upadis some time ago. So upadis are the things that limit Brahman so that it appears as an individual, a person covered by ignorance, subject to karma, and as an individual separate from the whole of creation. And isn't this actually the root of all suffering? The fact that we're an individual, we're answerable for our actions, but our actions are largely determined by factors external to ourselves. This is the human condition, the existential condition. And we discussed this long time ago at the very beginning of the channel in this series on the existential dilemma. So this is everyone's experience. How does it come to be that the unlimited, infinite, totally blissful Brahman huh, becomes covered over and is subject to suffering and karma and it happens to be responsible for its actions no matter what you know, the actual cause is? How is this possible? Well, it's Upadis. And as we discussed last time, the three conditioned states of consciousness act as filters to reduce the original consciousness of Turiya into the conditioned consciousness of waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. But this is a huge insight. And when you start working out the, the consequences of it, you know, what it actually means to be an individual in that condition. Well, it just about explains everything. You know, everything about our experience <laughs> as human beings in this world. And why at the same time, we can go inside through meditation and realize Brahman. So this is a wonderful insight, a wonderful breakthrough. Oh, but there's more. <laughs> See, the goddess has been showing me these things. Slowly, slowly, opening up my consciousness to these insights. And they're radical. They're completely amazing. But when you, once you hear them, it's like, oh yeah, of course, obviously. <laughs> So the insight that's blowing my mind today is the correlation between the four states of consciousness and Buddha's teaching of Paticca Samuppada. And dependent arising is the core structure of the Buddha's teaching. Paticca Samuppada begins from ignorance, then Sankara, consciousness, name and form, 
Six senses, contact, feeling, craving, grasping, becoming, birth, decay, suffering, and death. Then confidence, delight, joy, serenity, ease, concentration, knowledge, disenchantment, detachment, emancipation, extinction, and finally Nibbana. This is the Dhamma, Paticca Samuppada. This graphic shows the correlation, how when the being moves from the beginning, which is ignorance, down through consciousness, name and form, and so on. It's equivalent to moving from the highest state of consciousness, Turiya, down through Sushupti, which is ignorance, nothingness, and then into dream, Svapna, and finally into worldly consciousness of uh, Jagrat. And on the other side, the spiritual path begins in Jagrat, then moves into the dream state, Svapna, finally the void, Sushupti, and from that comes release, moksha, liberation, nibbana, which is the highest state of self-realization. So when God has showed this to me, I was like, no, no way. This would mean that ultimately, which I've been saying for a long time, and this proves it, there is no difference between the Buddha's teaching and the Vedic teaching. It's just a matter of using a different model, a different vocabulary, a different ontology, a different metaphor. But the actual teaching and the experience of the teaching is the same in terms of the states of consciousness one goes through. So I've been just like walking around, you know, mumbling to myself, <laughs> looking at Arunachala and going, wow, this, this is nuts, this is wild, this is crazy, this is great. This is great because it means the unity of spiritual knowledge at the root. This is a very important thing, something we have been preaching and teaching all along on faith as the esoteric teaching. Actually, not on faith, but based on our own experience. But we had to go deep into the scriptures and deep into meditation to confirm our hunch, our theory, huh? our postulate that this is really the way it is. The real nature of reality is that everything is one. Yeah, I know, we've heard this a thousand times before, but what is the proof and how does it work? So these explanations give that structural knowledge, that ontological knowledge, to show how it works and why it is the way it is. So this is deeper than just taking it on faith. Yeah, it's all one, yeah, all right. You ask any of these people to explain, well, how is it all one? They can't do a very good job, you know? They say, well, Brahman is one and everything is Brahman, so everything is one. Yeah, but how is everything one? And why are there states that in, in which you cannot see this, where it's not obvious, it's not observable, it's not experiential. Why are there stages on the path that require faith and that use metaphors that are constructions, obviously, to talk about gods and goddesses and the whole uh, life cycle of the universe and so on and so on, which no one, at least on this planet, has directly observed. In other words, it requires faith. 
So there must be a level of reality like that. But who has experienced that? See, only someone very advanced in meditation and bhakti. So this just clears so many doubts, answers so many questions that I think it's going to become, you know, the, the root on which our whole teaching stands. It's going to become the trunk of the tree of knowledge. That means that all branches of Vedic knowledge and ultimately all religions, because they're all connected to the Vedic knowledge ultimately, all religions can be shown to have the same root teachings. And that explains everything. And the only reason there are so many religions anyway is because of people's greed and profit motive and political divide and conquer. Like that was the reason behind, for example, Buddhism divorcing itself from the Vedic culture. And the same goes for Islam. Uh, there, there was really no need for another religion, but politically it had some function. And the same thing with like ISKCON and, you know, so many different sects and cults that really don't need to be separate from the mainstream of Vedic culture. And when we say that, what do we mean? The Vedas, the Upanishads. Uh, the Upanishads clearly state that Brahman is the absolute. That's what we should be trying to realize. Not these different, different Vishnu forms and demigods and so on like that. Why do they exist? only to serve as objects of worship in the different stages of development of consciousness. And once that stage is surpassed, that metaphor can be dropped and a higher view can be taken up. So it's not surprising then that Buddha denied the reality of God and so on like this because he was teaching on the level of Vivartavada, and in Vivartavada, the object is the void. And in the void, there are no gods. There is no form. There isn't anything. Huh? It's nothing. No thing. So on that level of consciousness, which is just prior to realization of Brahman, then there is no need for any metaphor because there is no form, there is no dimension, no movement, no time, no space, no cause and effect, in other words, no karma. Everything, all these metaphors that we use to explain the apparency of the material world are no longer necessary on that level. So when we're in that level, we don't need any of these crutches or any of these structures or any of these semantic tools or metaphors or ontologies. Uh, nothing is just nothing. <laughs> and it's a wonderful refuge from the world. So these are the reasons behind the way we teach. And even we come up with some radical points of view about sexuality and Tantra and meditation and all of this. It's all okay. Huh? Nobody needs to get upset and argue and, and post and nasty comments and all like this. Why? Because on that level of consciousness, it's a dream. And your dream can be whatever you want it to be. Whatever makes you happy, whatever makes you feel satisfied. Psychologically, what's happening is that we're compensating for the various traumas in our lives and the various emotional effects of those traumas. So whatever you need to dream to make it all okay, so you can worship God or goddess, that's, that's all right. So there's room for so many different interpretations of religion. In fact, there's a necessity for them to meet the needs of so many different kinds of people. This is the compassion of the goddess. So on that level, there's a need. And on the level of karma yoga, there's a need. 
There's a need for different religious forms to develop good karma, subha karma, for many different types of people in many different social and environmental situations. So there's so many religious forms, so many mantras, so many different kinds of puja, etc., etc. But all ultimately <laughs> are offerings of the water into the Ganga. Huh? When you worship the Ganges, the Ganga, you worship her with Ganga water, Ganga Jal. And so you're taking the water of the Ganges and offering it back to her. And this is the same as taking the forms and offering them to the formless, the reality, Brahman, Nibbana, the ultimate self-realization. We'll discuss this more in upcoming videos. Aung Tatsat, Aung Shakti Aung.